Oh, hi, everybody. A uh, bit of a change now. You've been hearing about uh, big technology and, and big projects, and now you're going to hear about a little minnow. But an interesting minnow, I think you'll find. I think unless you've all been sound asleep for the last two years, you'll probably be aware there's been a big debate going on about the urban-rural divide when it comes to broadband uh, provision. Uh, okay. We know that commercially about 6% of the country is going to get good broadband, thanks to commercial reasons and investment by BT and Virgin Media. The government has decided to put about 1.2 billion of public funding into uh, lifting that up to about 90%. Um, and then there's a big question about what you do with the last percent, 10%. I think the, the London view is move all those irritating people out of the countryside into the cities. But for those irritating people like me who live in the countryside, that's not a solution. So I'm going to tell you about it's a project where despite the fact that everybody believes that you cannot commercially roll out broadband into the deeply rural last few percent, our project will show you that, yes, indeed, you can. It's assuming I can navigate this machine, which I can. Right, just putting this in context, um, that is Lancashire, not the old county palatine of Lancashire, which included Greater Manchester and Liverpool, but as it is now after the bureaucrats have fiddled with it in the 70s. In the northern bit of that, this area up here, you've got a local authority, Lancaster, and it's 576 square kilometres, population 139,000, pretty low population density, 60,000 properties, so you get the property density there. That's Barnes footprint. Um, it's basically the area to the east of the M6 and between the Cumbria border and uh, the Bleasdale Fells and North Yorkshire County Council on the right. And that bit in pink, this big lump here, which is the majority of our area, is also an AONB. Um, very good if you want to go and look at hen harriers nesting. A nightmare if you're looking for broadband infrastructure because there isn't any there. And if you look at the numbers, you'll see our area is 425 square kilometres, which is a good chunk of that district. <coughs> Compare it with Manchester, we're about a third of the area of Greater Manchester. And if you look at the d densities of properties, you can see there's a huge gap. You can see why it's expensive to actually provide some sort of networking up there. We are a community project. And being a community project, uh, we fit in with the sense of community. And communities in the rural areas are parish-based. It's as simple as that. We may not be religious anymore, but administratively, parishes is still the, the, the unit that people associate with in the, in the rural areas. And what we're doing is 21 full parishes uh, comprising 3,500 and X properties, which keep moving up and down because people keep joining. Um, and one of our ethoses is that when we adopt a parish, we adopt a whole parish. It's a community project, so there's no exclusions. OK, what was the trigger for this project? The, the trigger was there are very few BT exchanges. In fact, there are only three in the whole of that patch. Uh, we have line lengths out to 12 kilometres. Uh, most of the lines are exchange only. Nearly everybody in that footprint has less than 512k. Very few above 2 megabits. My house, I managed to get, I think, about 200k. My neighbour, BT, couldn't even get to work. So it's a real basket case area if you want to live in that area and you need broadband. And to be fair, these days, the rural areas does need broadband. DEFRA uh, requires farmers to do everything online now. You can't submit paper. So if you haven't got broadband at home, you have to go into town, find a library, and register all your livestock movements and things like that. So a group of us who live out there got together one evening in a pub, as all the best schemes are always laid in a pub. I think we were drinking sparkling mineral water, but maybe we weren't. And what we decided was we wanted to solve the problem for this. And if we were going to sit down and do something, because BT didn't seem to be doing it, the government didn't seem to be doing it, so OK, let, let's see if we can do it ourselves. We set ourselves some ambitions. The European Union Digital Agenda 2020 targets is for 50% of properties in the UK, I think in fact the whole of Europe, uh, to have 100 megabits or better. So we wanted our properties, we were going to do something to be in that 50%. Uh, and the EU target was the rest of 30 megabits, but we'll leave that to the urban areas. Us people that live in the underprivileged rural areas want to have the best. I mentioned that we're, we're parish-based, and it was our ambition that we wanted 100% of properties. We didn't want any of this. You are too expensive to get to. And to put it in context, I think our worst property is 3.6 kilometres 
dig for a single, single farm. Uh, we wanted it to be future-proofed, so we wanted to be able to giga deliver a gigabit uh, and upwards without having to change the infrastructure. We wanted it to be affordable, so we set our, our, our minds at £150 connection fee and £30 a month for service. So, you know, this was either a bold and brave ambition or we were all start raving loony, depending on where you're coming from. If you're going to deliver that, you can only do it with fibre because you're talking about distances and speeds that just cannot be delivered over copper. Um, we needed to say at least 10 kilometre ranges uh, at a gig. And if somebody is going to tell me you can do that reliably with, with Wi-Fi when you haven't got any cellular structure or anything, no masts out there, uh, you're barking. You can't. It has to be fibre. We decided to roll FTTH, and we did it with a point-to-point, -point. Um, not GPON, not EPON. Uh, we wanted symmetrical. And we were going to blow, put two fibres per property, and we're running 1,000 base BX on one with a second held as a spare. We decided to go with blown fibre technology, narrow bore ducts, 16 mil, about the size of a one-inch water pipe buried about two foot deep. Why did we go for that? Because we were planning to go cross-country, and we were going to get the farmers and the landowners to not only grant us the way leaves, but to dig it. And if farmers, if you have a route that's got 11 farmers along it, and they're each going to dig their own bit, and they're going to do it after they've done lambing and silage and milking the cows, um, all the different bits are going to happen at different times. And you try free-issuing, say, armoured fibre cable for them to put in, it means you're going to have to chop it and splice it every... every Every, every time you change farmers, it's clearly not practical. But if you're sticking with something like the blown fibre, it works very well for this because we can issue HDPE tubes to them. It's only 35 pence a metre. We can drop reels of it off with each farmer and get them to get on with it. By the way, forget ITL, forget PRINCE2, forget any of the other project managements. Um, <laughs> when you're dealing with farmers, it's, it's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's NAG. It's community pressure, it's taken down to the pub for a pint, and if all else fails, you get the chairwoman of the WI to go and talk to them. <laughs> <laughs> um, so once we come up with the sort of the, the, the high-level design, we mapped every single property in all those parishes. And I'm giving you an idea that it's a finished project, but in a way, we started with eight parishes and it grew, because every time we did one parish, the people in the next one came up and said, we want to join in too. But where we are now is we mapped them all, we selected locations for village nodes, and I've put a picture of a village node up there. It doesn't show up very well, but i put a person in front of it to give you an idea of what it's like. It's about um, one and a half metres high, and there are either two or three bays and about 800 mils deep. Um, each node, the 16 of them, serves one or more parishes. Minimum is about 136 properties to a, a cabinet. Max is about 530. Uh, maximum line lengths, we tried to keep it down below 10 kilometres. But that wasn't the deciding factor on the 16. You actually have this sort of trade-off between putting more large fibre bundles in versus the distances, and, and you very quickly find that the cost of the fibre is, is, is greater than the cost of putting an extra node in. So we planned cross-country routes radiating out from each node to optimally pass all properties in the parish. Probably a bit like these algorithms you use for delivery drivers trying to work out the optimum, but I think we just did it in a pub over a pint. Um, we ended up with 278 kilometres of duct routes uh, and then another 242 of spurs. So we're talking about 520 kilometres of digging. To put that in context, that's Hadrian's Wall to the English Channel. Um, which is pretty impressive, or scary. Uh, and that's basically what it looks like. I mean, you've seen one trench, you've seen them all, so I'm not going to put lots of pictures up. But basically, because we're burying the duct 500 mils deep, we only need a narrow slot. Um, diggers with a minimum size bucket is what we use. Uh, we've mole ploughed in some places. That's an open trench, drop the, five, drop the duct in, uh, backfill it. Uh, and then we blow the fibre in once we've got the route complete, just using compression couplers to join the bits up. Uh, the bottom left-hand ones are a multiple 7 mil cable, so it's 16 mil for the core, 7 mil for the spurs to properties. And along the route, we have access chambers uh, to serve clusters of properties, and if we haven't got any suitable properties, we put a blowing chamber in to allow for not trying to blow too long. If you were doing this professionally and you were paying contractors to come and do it, you would expect to have a very nicely smoothly laid duct and therefore you could probably blow longer distances. 
uh, when it's being done hurriedly in the rain at the end of a long day, the bottom of those trenches is not as uh, straight and level as it should be. So we stuck to a 500 metre spacing on the, on the chambers, believing that, that, that there's a reasonable chance we could blow it 500 metres. Um, on areas where they've done well, we've blown 192 fibre bundles in nearly two kilometres without any problems. Other areas where the, the call of milking was, was great or something, uh, you know, you find 200 metres and you have to dig down, blow the fibre, fleet it and carry on. Um, and basically, it's all pretty well being done by the community. Uh, I think about 95% of the duct has been done by farmers uh, and people who live in the villages. And they basically come along and watch somebody doing it, and then they work with them for a while, and then they become proficient to do it on their own, and then they show the next lot in the next village how to do it. A bit like Chinese medicine, you know, sort of watch one, do one, teach one. Active kit. Uh, it starts getting a bit challenging when you want fibre facing, fibre ports on, on the uh, user side, because that's usually considered to be telco, you know, core equipment rather than, than edge access equipment. Uh, and we found it quite difficult because all the big boxes, you know, Cisco or anybody else that produces boxes, it's got large numbers of, of SFP-based fibre ports, very expensive. Uh, we found ourselves pushed into the enterprise business marketplace using Netgear stuff. Uh, we've got a load of them and we haven't had any failures with them, so I've been very pleased with them. I'm giving 10 out of 10, I have to say, uh, pricing and everything. We're paying well under £1,000 for a 24-port unit, so very affordable. And they've got the 10 gig SFPs for, for the back halls. Cost of the project, uh, 520 kilometres, it's about 3.8 million if we were to build 100% out. Cost per metre, if you divide the total bill by the, or the total amount by the bill, about £6.80. That's including uh, cabinets, it's including fibre, it's including everything, okay, active equipment. It also includes, which I'll come on to in a minute, our backhaul to Manchester and our big juniper routers and all that sort of thing. Um, which I think you'll agree, those of you who've had any experience of, of civil engineering, you'll, that is a damn good price per metre. Right, I'll have to speed up. How are we going to deliver that? We set up a co-op. Uh, it's a not-for-profit co-op, um, something called a community benefit society, which, like a co-op, you have shareholders, but you don't return any spare money to the shareholders. It goes back into the community. Um, rather like a charity in some ways, but you can trade. It's a one-member, one-vote. And at the end of the project, any free cash has to go back into the community. So th there's no room for capital gains, anything like that. And the reason we sap structured that is if you're going to ask all the landowners to give free way leaves and you're going to ask them to dig it, yeah, they must be bloody certain that nobody's going to make any money out of them. Farmers are the salt of the earth, but if anybody's going to make any money, it's going to be them they're not going to hand it over to some remote telco. So they have to be absolutely certain that what they were doing was for the good of the community and nobody's <coughs> going to make any money out of it. So that, that's, that really dictated our, our corporate structure. We went out with a share issue in December 2011. We made it tax uh, efficient, so the HMRC will give a 30% tax relief on those shares. And anybody buying £1,500 or more got a free connection, 12-month service. And they could actually buy shares either with cash or by actually digging. So we had a piecework that any work they did would be rewarded with shares against the, the piece workbook. Uh, we've had about a million pounds now we've had in from the com community so far, a mixture of, of cash and sweat. Bulk of that, about 800,000, it's cash so far. There's a load more sweat coming through. Uh, we bid for all sorts of grants from the government, but it's really like sort of cutting an arm and a leg off and hopping around on crutches. It's hopeless. Uh, we've got our fingers crossed, but we, we don't have very high expectations. However, we've built enough of the network that we're now in a position where we can negotiate commercial loans. So it looks as if the bulk of the rest of the cost is going to come out of uh, straight bank loans. Um, because we've been doing it with volunteers, our operating costs are very low. We only need about 300 paying customers to cover our OPEX. Uh, at 535 customers, we can service loans as well if we take on the rest of them to finish the job. After that, we start using the money to take on staff. So we reckon we need about six or seven staff. And as the cash flow permits, we'll take on the staff and the volunteers will sort of back off to be advisors and all have their nervous breakdowns. Um, uh, anything above about 1,200, the money will go into a sinking fund and then people can start redeeming their investment, their shares. Uh, 3,500 properties. Our business plan reckoned on a 50% take-up. Now, any of you who know anything about cable networks or anything else will go, 
you're not going to achieve that. You know, 20% are considered very good. And then we rest, estimated we could get to 80% by the end of year four, at which point you'll all say he's barking. Um, assuming we achieve those figures and paid 6.5% interest, we can pay back all the borrowed money by about year 12. And then we have a free cash flow of about half a million to a million, which will either have to go back to the community, uh, we can use it for things like school minibuses, village roofs, or uh, we can reduce the fees from the £30 a month. And it's going to be an interesting battle between avarice and altruism when we get to that point. And I'm going to be fascinated to see what they decide to do. OK, we talked about the inside of the network. What about the outside? And this is one of the big problems with community projects. It's, it's one thing building that fibre and getting a gigabit to each property. But it's not a lot of use if you run into a stone wall at the edge of your network. So our, our plan also included um, leasing dark fibre to a peering centre, and what we've actually taken is, is a, a dark fibre from uh, Geo down to, uh, we're in Kilburn House, and we've created our, our network node there. We're currently peering with Edge IX, and I'm halfway through filling in the form for IX Manchester and Lynx. Um, we take IP Transit there, but what's really important to us was, was the ability to control our traffic. If you've got a lot of, um, you've got a lot of one gig people coming in, uh, you need to be able to add a lot of capacity in to make sure uh, you can actually handle them. And having our own dark fibre, it simply means we can just bring wavelengths on as we need. So each village node, I, I mentioned those, uh, has two 10 gig circuits. Uh, it's diversely routed. What we actually have is a north and a south switching centre. Each village then has dual dark fibre links to those switching centres, and they've all been designed to be non-overlapping, so it's geographically diverse. Um, so you'll either have 20 gigs with everything's all right, or if some fool puts a JCB through our fibre, they'll drop back to 10. Uh, given that that 10 gig is serving a maximum of 192 properties, they're not going to be too embarrassed by lack of bandwidth. Um, we put Smart Optics DWDM on it, so we've got 32 wavelengths. It's a single fibre, so that was an interesting challenge. Uh, so, so we created our node in Kilburn House, and we've got an MX240 Juniper router down there in full redundant config. Uh, we registered with Ripe, got our AS numbers, as you'd imagine. We've established the peering. And many thanks to TMP who are here, who understand BGP and have done all that sort of stuff for us, because we're all right at digging trenches, but we, we struggle a bit when it comes to things like BGP4, but they know what they're doing. Thanks a lot. So that's basically what it looks like. Status, we've completed 20 routes. 150 kilometres of duct, we've passed 784 F7 properties, 462 are either live or about to become live. And interestingly, the average percentage take up across those routes is currently 57% and climbing. So when we reckon we'd achieve 50% in year one, we were very conservative. Our worst route is 45%, and it will be 50, I think, within a week or two, and the best is 95%. And the reason we're getting such a high turn up is multiple. One is their existing service is crap. You know, that really is non-existent. So, I mean, we're pushing an open door. Secondly, because it's the community that's doing it, there is a strong sense of supporting your community. And a lot of them are shareholders in Barn as well. So the churn, even if BT came in there and tried to do something, wouldn't be much because there's a sense of loyalty there. Um, just to put it in context, um, if you look at what we've dug and the number we've connected, we've averaged 400 metres per property connected. Gives you an idea of the scale of the operation compared to urban. We're connecting around 50 properties a month uh, through the rest of the year, which means we've got to dig about 20 kilometres a month. So, you know, this is, this is substantial civil engineering exercise. Uh, lessons learned. Uh, this is just to make you really jealous. I, I did that screen capture on my PC at home on Sunday <laughs> evening. <laughs> and... Though... The, 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 uh, we, we always do our speed tests against Ookla in Amsterdam because the only thing can actually speed test against the gig. We can't find anywhere else in the UK that can do it sensibly. Um, so that's great. The only problem is people run those tests and usually they get some pathetic number because everybody's using Wi-Fi in their houses to distribute it. And Wi-Fi is a rubbish way of trying to deliver a gigabit around a farmhouse. And they try and steam video. I mean, it's great, you know. BBC iPlayer, HD, 10 megabit stream, and then they wander around their house, you know, using rubbish Wi-Fi and all sorts of things, and then they ring us up, your network's broken. Uh, uh, so this is, this is a whole new set of challenges. Stone farmhouses don't like Wi-Fi anyway. 
Um, so, next steps, broadband's good, streaming video, okay, VoIP. Cellular, we'd like to deploy femto cells, but we can't find any operators who will help us. They all want to lock the femto cell down to their customers only. And uh, that's really not sensible, because you'll often have three or four different, you know, kiddies, mum, dad, they're all with different operators. What we need is somebody who will deploy a femto cell, and that's hand over at the end of a SIP trunk in Manchester or somewhere, the calls, and they can, you know, we'll, we'll give it to the right people. And the last thing they all want us to do is, is we can do everything else. Why can't we teleport the contents of their septic tank away by fibre as well? But that one's a challenge, but we are working on it. That's it. Sorry. Quick gallop. <laughs>Excellent stuff. Thanks for presenting that. Um, you said uh, on the almost the last slide that you got an AS number from RIPE. Yep. Uh, my understanding that now, if you're a brand new operator and you try to get IPv4 addresses, you get 1,024 from RIPE. Um, I think we got. Um, I think we got eight. No, I think we got eight class Cs when we applied. So we got slash 22. When? When did you apply? Yeah. We got two K's worth. Two thousand. Yeah. Oh, okay. And you have sixty thousand customers. Uh, we 60, have sites three and, and a half thousand customers. Yeah, it's going to be interesting how we do that. I mean, uh, I guess we can go back to Ripe and ask for more, but I suspect you, you won't we'll get any more. Just interest. a little heads up, you won't get yeah. any more. All right. There Carry aren't any more. Yeah. We're fully IPv6. We're, we're v6 oh, and v4 uh, stack. That's handy. Through. Yeah. What we, that's we cool. give the end user a CPE that's got four. Uh, 10, 100, 1 gig, copper, uh, 802.11n, and um, got a couple of SIP ports as well, but we're not using those. And that box is, I, is V4 and V6, so we're, we're, we're all the way through the network, so we, we can go. That's and cool. I, think, I guess we could be pushed that from exactly what you say, address starvation. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thanks. <laughs> Hi, Barry. Uh, Wolf, Wolf Hargrave from Lonap here. Great presentation. Um, there was some discussion on IRC. Um, Obviously, um, you have quite a lot of fibre per home, or to, you've got a lot of fibre in the ground in order to deliver each property. And um, we want we wonder what assessment you've made of the um, business rates on fibre and uh, the costs to your operation. Yeah, well, the, the business rates for us would apply from the cables TV side, which is something like, I think it's £20, or the some number, I can't remember what it is now, per property pass. Um, another reason why we went for a not-for-profit community benefit society is it get looked on favourably by the business rates people for discretionary rates relief. So if we were a charity, we would be able to apply for that. Uh, as a not-charity but a not-for-profit community benefit, we should be able to get rates exemption. But either way around, it wouldn't affect the economics of our project very much. It would if we were, lit, if we were charged per metre lit, but on the cable TV model, it shouldn't. Yeah, I, 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 I sort of estimated that your bill... If it, if, if it was on a, on a commercial basis, on a per, per fibre lit, it would be you know, a, a good six-figure sum. Yeah. yeah, I mean, the amount of fibre in the ground we've actually put in and the number of lit metres is, is, is vast. Mm. I dread to think what it is. I've never sat down and counted it, but I'll do it one day for a presentation. <laughs> Thanks. Um, Barry, despite um, people thinking otherwise, I think this is a great project. I, I, I only have one slight issue with it, which is your work, use of the word commercial. Um, so I've worked for many. So I work for BT today, as you know, but um, I've worked for many different telcos and many different disguises, putting in thousands upon thousands of root kilometers, right? Um, and my frustration is when people say, oh, well, this is really easy. It's easy if you've got volunteers, and it's easier if you've got support from the local community and the farmers. And I never all said easy. I no, no, well, sorry, easy. easy yeah, anyway. okay, that, that's fair challenge. Easy out, yeah, right? Back these scars. Yeah, um, and, and, you know, I appreciate, in my mind, the hard work that you've put into it. So I remember years ago in Finchley, we were rooting Cat 5 along window boxes to get connectivity to people, right? Um, <laughs> It's still there, actually. Um, if, if you want to, if you want the address, I'll tell you. Um, the um, but, but I, I just, you know, the minute you turn up, like I remember, we had a dispute when I was in the last company I worked at with a farmer, and and it was all about way leaves, and and you know the discussion that was, I want a big chunk of money if you want to put fibre down my field, and and I think it, it's that sort of um, scenario that I, I, you know, it's not. 
when, when, when someone recognises that someone is trying to perhaps make money or do something, all of a sudden they want a piece of the action. It's not to say that's everywhere, but it is in a number of cases. No. And, I, mean, and I, I don't want to be scathing about the commercial operators. They all have shareholders to, to respond yeah. to. I mean, it just would not make economic sense to use the traditional telecoms building model to, to get out to where we are. Yeah, I agree. I mean, if we choose to live in a very nice neck of the woods, and it is nice, I mean, we always say that the, the, the quality of the view is, is inversely proportional to the speed of the broadband. But, you know, if you want to live out there where it's really nice, you accept things like you know bus services are not there, yeah. you know, a lot of the services are not there. You just accept these things, and the community is willing, in, in my experience, to put time and money in. What they need is the catalyst. They need a core of people who can tell them what to do, who can design it, can motivate them. And I think it's, it's really just the two are complementary. I mean, on the yeah. one hand, you've got commercial footprint. You've got these really difficult ones to do. And I mean, to be quite honest, I think it's, it's quite reasonable to say to the community, you know, get off your backsides and do something about it yourself. The only thing that would have been nice if some of these vast sums of grants that have gone through BDUK to BT, if they'd given us some of the loose change out the corner of their pockets. But, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, I sadly didn't, dis didn't um, design the BDUK solution. Um, but, but I think, I mean, I look at what we're doing in Scotland, for example, we're deploying 30 three zero submarine cable systems. Yeah. It's a project I'm running. You're not going to get a community to do that. You know, it's, it's the, the, the kind of effort required. Um, where, it's, where it's possible, absolutely, I think that's great. And, 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 uh, um, and I applaud what you've done. Actually, if I lived there, I probably would have done something very similar. Mm. Um, and, and um, you know, if there's any help I can give, let me know. Okay, we're, we're eating into break and beer time here, so Nat and then Cathy. Oh, yeah. you didn't want a question. Okay, so Nat then. Hi, uh, Nat Morris, I've got two questions. Um, the, f the first is, uh, what, what's happened to house prices in the area? And the second one is, um, what happens when someone moves house or passes away? <laughs> okay. Um, Anecdotally, Ricks uh, and the other chart and Halifax and so on have both found evidence of increase in property prices where they've got very good broadband. Uh, we couldn't quantify yet that in our patch because the numbers aren't big enough. What we can say is that people are advertising their properties being on the barn fibre network and they are shifting quick. Secondly, we are getting a lot of inquiries from um, people who are looking to do one-man bands, small startups type things, asking for, do, could we point them at businesses within our, our neck of the woods that are on our fibre network? Um, we take a view that the point about barn isn't commercial. It's about uh, saving the community, if you like. We want people with chick kids to be able to live in the community and they need broadband for the kids. We want businesses to stay there, not migrate into town, that sort of thing. So our whole ethos is, is, is about GVA in the rural communities. I, mean, I didn't mention it, but I mean, we have a 10 gig service. If any property wants 10 gig, they can have 10 gig. We charge them under £25 a month, no problem. Um, the, you know, we, we are not driven by the, by the profit motive. Uh, technically, we can do these things, and we would. If it will, somebody wants to come along and say, I'm going to build, I, we want to build a data centre in the middle of nowhere, uh, our answer would be great. Now, here we are, have some fibre. What about the change of ownership question when someone moves house? How do you handle that? Sorry? What about when someone moves house? About? When someone moves house. Nat, Nat is asking, what about when someone moves house? What? <laughs> this is work. Oh, I see what you mean. Uh, yeah, shares are not transferable. So if somebody uh, has got fifteen hundred pounds worth of shares, uh, they have to wait for the three years bef uh, before they can do it. Even if they move house, they can't do anything about it. They're not transferable shares; they're only withdrawable. But. Um, the fibre that's there in the house obviously continues to operate. The next one who moves in doesn't pay a connection fee again. They just pick up the £30 a month. Uh, and it's a bit unfortunate because if somebody who was in there moves to a house three houses down, they end up with a fresh connection fee, which, oh boy, do they whinge. <laughs> OK, thank you very much, Barry. <laughs>